Good evening, welcome to APTN National News. I'm Dennis Ward. The family of a Winnipeg man who died two months ago is taking their fight for justice to the streets and the courtroom. Nielsen Catchaway was assaulted and then hit by a car in October. APTN brought you the family's story last week. Here's Brittany Hobson with more following court proceedings for the two youth accused of assaulting Catchaway. Family members of Nielsen Ketchaway filled a Winnipeg courtroom Friday afternoon. It was the first time they got to see the two youth accused of assaulting their son and brother. The two young boys were in court for bail hearings. At the time of the incident, one was 14, the other was 13 and has since turned 14. They've been in custody since they were charged with manslaughter. Ketchaway was found on Main Street in Winnipeg's North End around midnight on October 16th. Police say he was assaulted during a robbery. Shortly after, in a separate incident, he was hit by a car. This week, officers told Ketchaway's family they found the driver of the vehicle. I was really hurt. I was really uh, hurt, just like uh, a book opened again. Martha Ketchaway organized a vigil in honor of her son on Thursday afternoon. About a dozen people gathered at the scene where Ketchaway was found. They wanted to keep the memory of the 40-year-old alive. We need justice. That's what I'm asking for today. She says police told her they would not be charging the driver. In court today, at the time of this broadcast, a judge had not made her decision whether to release the two youth until the trial. She's reserving that for later this evening. Brittany Hobson, APTN National News, Winnipeg. It's been a year of surprising political twists and turns, a deadly opioid crisis, and a potential collapse of the salmon industry in BC. APTN's Tina House has a look back at some of the top stories she's shared with our viewers in 2019. In April, all eyes were on Ottawa as Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada, Jody Wilson-Raybould, along with Dr. Jane Philpott, were removed from the Liberal caucus. This after the Prime Minister stated that there was an erosion of trust after Wilson-Raybould released a phone conversation with the Privy Council clerk, Michael Warnick. It backed up her claims that she was pressured to interfere on the prosecution of SNC-Lavalin in an ongoing criminal case. Jody, 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 Jody. But by year's end, Jody Wilson-Raybould, who decided to run as an independent, was victorious and won in the Vancouver Granville riding, making her the only independent candidate to win across the country. We accomplished together something extraordinary. We accomplished showing Ottawa, showing our political process that independent, strong voices matter and that we can do politics differently. And just recently, SNC Lavalin pled guilty to a single charge of fraud and agreed to a $280 million fine. Ironically, it was on the same day that the Canadian press named Jody Wilson-Raybould Newsmaker of the Year. Salmon stocks are down in nearly every river in B.C. and some are saying that they are on the brink of extinction. In some cases, there wasn't any fish at all this year. In late June, a massive landslide was discovered along the Fraser River where migrating salmon were returning. The slide made it impassable. The B.C. government stepped in with numerous initiatives to help, including bringing in rock scalers. All right, let's go save some salmon. Salmon were also scooped up by hand and removed by helicopter past the debris. However, just recently, the Chilcot Nation declared a state of emergency after the Big Bar landslide created long-term and dire consequences for the Chinook and Sockeye fish. Fisherman like Mike Sparrow isn't just worried about the salmon at Big Bar. 
is concerned about the entire salmon industry across the province. The salmon don't have a clear path right now, um, out or back in. They, they go through the gauntlet of fish farms leaving and they're exposed to parasites and, uh, and also uh, viruses. And on the way back in, they're, uh, they're uh, running through a gauntlet of uh, sport fishing lines. In 2017, bloody effluent was discovered to be flowing into the ocean from discarded Atlantic farmed salmon that were being processed at a plant on Vancouver Island. It was tested and it came back positive for the pristine Rio virus. Despite an uproar from environmentalists and the provincial and federal governments, it's been recently discovered that the bloody effluent is still being pumped into the ocean two years later with migrating wild salmon nearby. It's also tested once again positive for PRV. The virus is linked to organ failure of salmon. <coughs> 2019 was once again a deadly year on the mean streets of Vancouver's downtown east side. There's no such thing as heroin anymore. You know, heroin's heroin. You know, some, someone ruined the whole heroin gig and just started bringing out this fentanyl shit and it, it's done nothing but kill people and, uh, you know, kill a lot of kids. The crisis has spurned the chief medical health officer of BC to recommend an unconventional solution. I'm recommending a regulated legal supply of drugs to replace the toxic illegal supply, not only here in our region, but elsewhere in Canada where overdoses are occurring. Say a prayer that we find justice. The issue of murder to missing women is still ongoing, despite numerous rallies and protests, including Indigenous women riding motorcycles across North America raising awareness of MMIWG. In 2019, the National Inquiry into MMIWG wrapped up with the conclusion that there is a genocide of Indigenous women and girls in Canada. This public outing of the fact that Indigenous people across Turtle Island are in fact targeted by the genocide comes as no surprise to Indigenous communities. And shortly after the final report was released, the Prime Minister was asked about that finding. Do you believe that it was genocide, Mr. Prime Minister? I think one of the challenges we face right now is uh, a lot of people are engaging in debate over words. As I've said, uh, we accept the findings of the commissioners uh, that it was genocide. But our focus is going to be, as it must be, on the families, on the communities, that have suffered such loss. And rounding out one of the biggest stories in 2019 was the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People becoming law in BC. Uh, it is an enormous privilege on this historic day uh, to grant royal assent to Bill 41, thereby enshrining the human rights of Indigenous people in law. BC is the first province in the world to make UNDRIP law. Where there was a clash between Crown and Aboriginal title, that will mean now, I be believe, a bond between a true government to government, not just an agreement, but a true partnership, a collaboration between governing systems, one that's been here for thousands of years and one that's been here just over a hundred years. Tanse, on behalf of everybody at APTN National News' BC Bureau, we want to wish you a very happy holidays. I'm Tina House, and thanks for tuning in. Still to come, we chat with AFN National Chief Perry Belgard about a bombshell report out today on the raid of the Wet'suwet'en camps. Stick around. Here's a look at your Saturday weather forecast starting on the East Coast. Zero and showers in Halifax, zero and flurries in Charlottetown. 18 below in Kujuak, minus 12 under sunny skies for Nain, minus 9 in Montreal and Saguenay, 12 below in Chibugamu, plus 3 in Toronto and London, plus 6 for Windsor, plus 1 with rain in Thunder Bay, zero with snow for Wawa. Minus 16 and snow in Churchill, 
8 below with flurries for God's Lake. Plus 2 in Winnipeg, Gimli and Dauphin. Plus 1 in Brandon. 5 above for Swift Current under sunny skies. Minus 3 in Saskatoon. 13 below with snow in Uranium City. Minus 8 with flurries in Meadow Lake. Welcome back. Child welfare, languages, youth suicide. There was no shortage of pressing issues in 2019. For a look back and a look forward, we're joined by the National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations, Perry Belgard. National Chief, thanks so much for joining us. You recently said this is a pivotal moment for First Nations. Why do you feel that way? Well, I look at it in the sense of um what have we gotten done so far in 2019 in the years before and then 2020 going forward with this minority government? And I take stock and uh, look at uh, uh, the fact that we did move and push government on ending boil water advisors, but they're not done yet. Uh, we pushed government to invest in housing and education and water with $21.4 billion over seven fiscal years. We pushed them and got two very important key pieces of legislation passed, which is C91 on languages, revitalization of our indigenous languages, and then C92 on child welfare. Uh, now we have to see the full implementation of both those bills going forward. Uh, that was in the past number of years, but with this minority government now in 2020 going forward, uh, we've got to have the full implementation again of those bills, C91 and C92. Uh, we've got to have the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples legislation passed, you know, for the full implementation of that. Uh, we've got to implement uh, all the calls to justice from the MMIW, Missing Murder, Indigenous Women and Girls, uh, there are 230 plus calls to justice, has to be implemented. Um, dealing with the youth suicide crisis as well. Uh, and then, you know, I think of the throne speech and the first time ever we've had an Indigenous chapter on reconciliation. And it, to have the Governor General, the Queen's representative, the Crown's representative speak to the spirit and intent of treaties and uh, looking at the reestablishment of a treaty commissioner or a treaty commission is, is going to be key. So, uh, pivotal time, very important time, lots of work to get done. Uh, it's a minority government, so people will speculate as to how long do we have to work with this minority government. Is it 24 months or 36 months or 48 months? So uh, we've got to really put our efforts in place. And if we can uh, make sure that the government does what they say they're going to be doing in terms of priorities, we'll get results. A lot on the horizon for the next year, certainly. Uh, as you've likely seen, there's an exclusive report out this morning from The Guardian today revealing what uh, that, that RCMP were prepared to shoot Indigenous people during last January's raid on the Wet'suwet'en camps and that they were prepared to apprehend children. What's your reaction to this story? Well, one of the things I've always said, in, in Canada... All the judges and all the lawyers and all the police forces, they're sworn to uphold two laws, common law and civil law in Quebec. I've also said that there is First Nations law, natural law, creator's law. And if the RCMP were sworn to also uphold that, you wouldn't have that use of force up at the Wet'suwet'en. So that's where we have to get in uh, 2020 and beyond. It's starting to look at restorative justice versus punitive justice systems in Canada, but respect for First Nations law and jurisdiction as well, in addition to common law and civil law. And Canada is such a great country, Canada is such a big country, there has to be space for that, to, for that recognition about jurisdiction and First Nations law, natural law, creators law. That's my comment on that. If that wouldn't have happened if the RCMP or any police force was sworn to uphold and protect our laws as well, in addition to common law and civil law. Are you uh, planning to speak with the RCMP, the federal government, about what's coming out in that report? That'll be one of the things in our things to do, and a list to, of many things to do, but that, we'll add that to the list, no question. Because we always say we've got to build a better country together. And, and you have to make sure that those lines of communication are open and, and keep moving towards better policy and better legislation. You, be, you, you get a better country that way. You build a better country when there's respect for rights and title and jurisdiction. And uh, that's definitely added to our things to do list in the new year. We're hearing more from First Nations people, especially younger ones, millennials, saying that the AFN they feel is in lockstep with the patriarchal Indian Act system. Well, what do you say to that? I say we all want to move beyond the Indian Act. There's no question. The Indian Act's been around since 1876. And I've told uh, and, and recommended to chiefs and councils and treaty areas and nations 
that if we want to move beyond the Indian Act, we have to create our own laws and occupy the field. And that's what we need to do when we reconstitute ourselves as nations. And that's the work going forward. And whether you do it by reserve by reserve, or band by band, or by treaty areas, or by nations, that's the work right across Canada. We need to move beyond the Indian Act. There's no question of that. And whether you're talking about citizenship versus band membership, whether you're talking about jurisdiction over your lands, uh, whether you're talking about developing your own education system, your cultural, like, it's basically, the Indian Act definitely is passe, but it's up to First Nations themselves to exert their jurisdiction as to how they want to move beyond the Indian Act, reconstituting themselves as nations or by treaty territories. And uh, so I agree with the young people. Like, we've got to move beyond the Indian Act. But it's a, it's a phase process. It's a plan-by-plan plan process. And one size won't fit all. And we've got to be respectful of the diversity across Canada. Another issue that's right near where you are right now, uh, the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation has asked for an equal share of the former U.S. Embassy across the street from Parliament mm -hmm. Hill. Uh, why hasn't the AFN agreed to give it to them considering the new Indigenous Peoples Building is on unceded Algonquin land? We're working with the Algonquin Chiefs, no question, and uh, Grand Chief Paulson and, and Frankie from Kitigan ZB, and, and we're trying to find the best common ground, and with our partners, Métis National Council and the Inuit, ITK. Um, I think we have a great opportunity. You know, mm -hmm. 100 Wellington is right across from the House of Commons. Uh, the Prime Minister gifted that to the MNC, AFN, and ITK a few years back. Uh, now, through the Algonquin, as we respect their land and territory. Uh, we, I'll always support that. There's no question about that. And there's some other opportunities, you know, instead of not just one space at 100 Wellington, but a couple of other opportunities that are there. We want to make sure we work closely with the Algonquin Chiefs to make sure we get this right and make sure that we have a good celebratory opening in the near future. National Chief, the Me Too, Me Too movement has brought scrutiny to some Indigenous leaders and questions about support for victims. The AFN adopted a code of conduct this year to address sexual harassment, but it only applies to its own executive. What else will the AFN be doing to introduce standards of behaviors for chiefs across the country? Again, Assembly First Nations is, uh, uh, we've, we've reacted quickly to any kind of bullying or harassment. Uh, you know, we don't condone that in any way, shape or form. So we've got policies and procedures that impact on myself as national chief and all the 10 regional chiefs, the CEO at the AFN and all the staff, and we adhere to that. Uh, we'd hope that those good guidelines that are in place, those good policies that are in place, can be reflected at, if the chiefs and councils want to adopt them because they're, they're quite robust. And uh, it's something that we want to keep supporting going forward. Um, in 2019 and 2020 and beyond, there is no room for any kind of bullying or harassment in any way, shape, or form. So we've got policies and procedures in place. Uh, we believe they're very robust. They're very, they're very uh, beneficial. And I think and I would encourage any First Nation or Tribal Council or PTO to look at them and adopt them. Well, National Chief, as you say, a busy 2019 and uh, looking to be a very busy 2020. We appreciate you taking some time for us here today. <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity. I would say if we work together uh, with governments, uh, you're going to build a better country because we have to keep investing in education, and housing, and water, and infrastructure, and dealing with the high youth suicides, and too many of our kids in foster care. Uh, once that gap closes, it's not only good for our people, it's good for Canada. National Chief, have yourself a great holiday and all the best in the new year. Yeah, same to you and your family. Happy holidays. There's been a big development in the day school class action settlement details after the break. Here's the rest of Saturday's weather forecast picking back up in northern Alberta. Minus 16 with snow for high level, 8 below in Fort McMurray, plus 10 in Medicine Hat under sunny skies, 11 above for Lethbridge, plus 8 with showers for Victoria, Vancouver and Tofino, minus 22 in Fort Nelson, minus 2 and sunny for Prince George. Minus 39 in Old Crow, 14 below with snow in Whitehorse. 24 below with snow for Yellowknife, minus 30 in Norman Wells. 33 below in Saks Harbor, minus 37 for Colville Lake. Minus 31 in Cambridge Bay, 17 below for Baker Lake. Minus 31 in Joe Haven, minus 10 with snow for Cape Dorset.
There's been a major development in the McLean Day School class action, and it's good news for a change. APTN online news reporter Kathleen Martins is here with details. Kathleen, thanks for joining us. You've been following the proposed day school class action settlement agreement. What's the latest? Well, Dennis, finally some good news for these day school survivors, their former students who were forced to go to these residential schools during the day but could go home at the end of the school day because they lived nearby. It had been on hold in the last few weeks because of a legal challenge uh, initiated by a, an Indigenous leader in northern Quebec, but he has now dropped those challenges. There's been a lot of ups and downs with this agreement. Uh, what was the latest hiccup? Right, so this uh, Chief Ottawa is his name. He had a couple of issues he wanted the court to address, and so he thought filing a challenge to this class action was a good way to uh, bring attention to his issues. Uh, but uh, the court turned down one of his appeals, and uh, the other one, he was deciding whether he was going to go forward. And then there was uh, a call from the National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations, Perry Bellegarde. He sent uh, this letter, his office shared with me today, and it talks about how uh, Chief Bellegarde met with Chief Ottawa and also the regional chief in Quebec. They talked about it, they decided uh, it would be best to drop these challenges so that the compensation process could go ahead and uh, stop upsetting between 120,000 and 140,000 survivors of the day school system. And so what does this all now mean for those survivors? Well, it means we're going to find out early in the new year a date for when compensation will begin being paid out. It's been a long time coming, a lot of stops and starts, as you mentioned earlier, but it sounds like we're on the very last leg of getting this thing settled and uh, these uh, adults now who were children who suffered harms by being forced by Canada to attend these schools, uh, they can finally receive some compensation for their experiences. Many say they had bad experiences and uh, it can wrap up this settlement. Kathleen, I uh, appreciate you joining us here to bring us this latest. You're welcome, Dennis. Well, that is your APTN National News for this Friday. For much more, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. We leave you tonight with seven-year-old Serena Kingbert singing Jingle Bells in Mi'kmaq. Dennis Ward, thanks for tuning in. Have a great weekend. Did you watch go? Did you watch go? I remember it all. Oh, did you watch go? Did you watch go? I remember it all. Oh, did you watch go? Did you watch go? I remember it all. Once there we go. Oh, once there we go. There we are, my life in plant. Mark me, get it took. Bending to the egg. There you was all. Well, I did you watch go? Now, well, that's the check. I'll get a belly out of the egg. Did you watch go? Did you watch go? I need it all. Well, yeah, yeah, I don't think that's what I need to go.